Welcome to St. Patrick's and this Catalyst for Renewal Forum. Uh, Catalyst was set up to promote conversation and it's as well as we begin this particular forum to recall something of the origins of Catalyst. It's important because it's been a, a slow growth but a very rich one. Back in 1994 when I was at the Catholic Theological Union, John Menadieu got in touch with me and asked me to contact 12 or so uh, lay people. He was wanting to have a, what he was calling a festival of the laity at that time, something to put a bit of spirit, inject a bit of energy into the church. So we met at his place in Balmain uh, one Sunday in July and two points came up which meant that we didn't go ahead with the festival of the laity, but we went ahead with something else. The first one was we didn't think it was a good idea to focus on the laity. The laity are those who are not clergy. And from the time of the Second Vatican Council particularly, baptism has been recognised as what unites us. The Christian faithful is a better kind of a focus for anything that we do. The second thing was we didn't like the idea of just having a, a good weekend together and then leaving it at that. Uh, we wanted to do something that was more ongoing, uh, perhaps deeper and more enduring. So we kept meeting, and at the end of that year, 1994, we formulated our mission statement. It was Geraldine Duke who suggested that we focus on conversation. Now, I have to say, speaking from my own point of view, and I suspect for the others, we didn't understand or fully grasp the immense richness in that focus. There is a whole spirituality in conversation, uh, a meeting, an encountering of other people. And so we've proceeded from there. And all the forums are based on this spirituality of conversation. I'd venture to say that it's a wonderful affirmation for our work since that time that Pope Francis is now calling us to synodality. I think the spirituality of conversation is the beating heart of synodality. Um, i just read to you some notes which uh, the Catalyst members put together in reflecting on conversation. What is it? It's a word that's used a lot. We use it in a very specific way. Conversation is a process whereby we encounter others in a mutual search for what is true. Conversation requires a willingness and ability, A, to listen at depth for what is happening within me and between us, B, to refrain from preempting the outcome, C, to be transformed through this encounter with the other. Conversation is much more than mere talk or even discussion or debate, and it's certainly not argument. Conversation is at its best when the participants are together actively seeking to submit to the guidance of the Holy Spirit. A spirituality of conversation will emerge for participants as they give themselves to the process of conversation. Richard has given us as his topic an in-between church. You know, I think one of the greatest discoveries at the Second Vatican Council was that sense of the church as a pilgrim people, a travelling people. Um, we'd come to the unfortunate illusion that we'd arrived and that illusion is still held by some. But I think Pope Francis is very, very... Uh, beautifully and gently saying, look, we walk together. The very notion of walking together is, is crucial. So I'm not going to say anything more about you. It's all on, your, on the flyer that we've submitted, Richard, except to say um, how proud we are of you. I, when you uh, were seconded, I don't know whether that's the right word to go, to Boston, I thought, oh, my goodness, uh, Australia has lost one of its best theologians. You've emerged on the international scene. 
so in a very beautiful way. So you belong to Australia, but you also belong to the global church. And we're very pleased to welcome you here today as part of our Catalyst Forum. Thank you, uh, Michael, so much for that introduction. Uh, when Michael mentioned that this is the approaching the 30th anniversary for Catalyst, I, I think the first time I ever spoke to Catalyst was probably about 27 years ago, So, it's, uh, and I've done it a number of times since. Uh, I'm glad none of us are getting older. That's a nice, <laughs> a nice thing. So I'm grateful to Jan for the invitation and to Denise for doing the logistics along the way. Uh, it's really my pleasure to be with you this afternoon, so thank you. Thank you for giving up such a beautiful Sydney Sunday afternoon to, uh, to be here as well. Can I just, if we can't see you... Oh, OK. I stand here? Sure. That's fine. Yeah, thank you. It's a light... I I'm used a light colour on the screen, so I didn't uh, want the lights on because otherwise people would be, be missing it down the back. This topic, in some ways, it, it's, uh, it's, it's a statement of fact. It's not that I need to make a case that the church lives in an in-between time or that it's an in-between church. I think it's an inescapable reality. Uh, as Michael mentioned, Vatican II speaks of the church as a pilgrim, and a pilgrim, by definition, is in-between. So pilgrimages start somewhere, and in the most famous instance, of course, of the Camino de Compostela, they end somewhere. But at any given point, a pilgrim is in between. And if you applied that analogy to the church, it, it does begin somewhere. We have a history. Uh, the end point is not as tangible and concrete as Compostela, but it is the fullness of life in God. At any given point, though, we are in process to that fullness of life. We, it doesn't have a timetable. It doesn't have a definite map of what every step is going to look like. We simply live in the in-between. We live in the moment that is the moment of the spirit. And as for living between, in an in-between time, I think that too is inescapable. Uh, again, it, it's not that it's absolutely concrete. We know where the starting point is and we know where the end point is. But we do know how much we experience change. So... In lots of ways, this whole topic is about change. And change in the church has been sort of my abiding interest. Um, not just that it changes, but how do we think about change? How do we think about the reality of living in in-between spaces? People often talk about liminal spaces and liminal, the Latin word for the edge, the border, uh, but I like in between even more because it's, it's not as definite as saying there's an edge and a border that, that can be very specific. The instances of in-betweenness culturally are, are just so abundant. As someone who comes to Australia every now and then, I'm always staggered by the Sydney I left is not the Sydney I came home to, uh, even if I, I was only away for five minutes. I, I think of that line of Harry Seacombe, he said, Sydney is a great city, or at least it will be when it's finished. Um, <laughs> and it, it never is finished. That, that's the reality of, the, and not just the physical infrastructure of the city, but the things that we value, the things that, that guide and direct our lives. And if, it give you the obvious examples that we all share, the, the impact of COVID. I mean, five years ago, nobody knew the word COVID. And yet, all of a sudden, as the Americans would say, it changed on a dime uh, from March of 2020 onwards. Think about the, the, the relationship. One of the things that really stuns me when I have come home in the last few years, both before COVID and since COVID, has been the movement in Australian perceptions of our Indigenous peoples. Now, Again, we're in between that. We've still got a long way to go to genuine reconciliation. But one of the things that struck me during the first session of the Plenary Council, the, the session that we did online, was that every single person who logged on and spoke could say what people's land they were coming from. Now, 50 years ago, that would have been unimaginable. 
And if you think of the progress from the bridge walks at the beginning of this century to Kevin Rudd's statement of apology to the stolen generations to the debate about voice at the moment, as, as complex and as um, conflicted as that debate is, nonetheless, it's a debate that we're having in ways that, again, prior to the 67 referendum just wouldn't have been imaginable. What it looks like, what it looks like in five years or ten years or 50 years, none of us can know at this stage. The one thing you can say with certainty is that it will look different from what it looks at the moment. And that's true for us as a church. So the church of John Paul II and Benedict is not the Church of Francis. And I don't mean that in the sense that there's no similarities or no connection. But the differences are very real. What's the trajectory of the synodal process? What will synodality do for us if it really finds a home in, again, five years, 20 years, 50 years? None of us can know. know, we, We don't even know what's going to happen by lunchtime on Tuesday, let alone what's going to happen beyond that. What we can say with absolute certainty is that life will keep moving. So what I want us to look at this afternoon and what I would like us to think about together is not, not so much, well, what could be. It's less about prediction. It's actually uh, about thinking about the experience from the other perspective, which is how do we live with the experience of dislocation? Because one thing that change does is it dislocates. And dislocates, it provides opportunity, so there's a very positive side to change, but change means that what you have now is not what you will have. And that experience can be dislocating. So what I'd like us to consider as part of this in-betweenness is the process of, or is the experience of dislocation. So let me just get my clicker here. So I want to begin with a a definition of dislocation that comes from this book by the American Jesuit Paul Crowley that came out in uh, 2017, so just a few years ago, uh, called The Unmoored God. Paul Crowley was the editor of Theological Studies, a fine academic strongly influenced by Rana, and sadly died a few years ago of cancer after a really sort of painful uh, illness. But this is his uh, definition of dislocation. So, just I I won't read all the the PowerPoints, but this one you might need to get if you're down the back. The way we understand the world has changed. The order and boundaries of the old dispensation has given way to uncertainty and ambiguity to being dislocated. So, he's not in any way arguing that this is unequivocally a bad thing. He's simply saying it is a reality. And what I'd like to do is to name some of the experiences of dislocation. So this is not a definitive list and each one of us in the room could make up our own list of the things that that say that the world as it exists now is different from the world of 20 years ago, 50 years ago and so on. And that in the midst of those differences, it plunges all of us into uncertainty. Again, think of COVID as the archetypal example. In March, April, May and so on of 2020, none of us knew would there ever be vaccines? Would there ever be enough PPE for people to wear? Would transport get back to normal? Although in Sydney, transport getting back to normal is not something that (laughs) ever happened anyway. So all of those things that are societal influences that affect every single one of us, regardless of age, of gender, of social situation. And apart from those great big issues, there's the more subtle, less sort of tangible things. Think of the language that we've used in the last few years, that language that, again, didn't exist 20 years ago. I, I can't 
live in the United States without having to think about misinformation and disinformation. Uh, misinformation is not just that people get it wrong. Disinformation is people get it deliberately wrong in order to distort the truth. The whole world of artificial intelligence, the, the world of chat GBT. As someone who works in higher education, this is a massive question. What is chat GBT going to mean for the future of education? Will students ever again write a paper that, that some machine didn't write? And so on and so on. And, and more tangibly then, about relationships. Do people actually have face-to-face -face relationships anymore or do we only have virtual relationships? And the, the church is not exempt from any of this. So think about you know, the, the single most painful experience of dislocation that we've lived through in the last generation and that's the sexual abuse crisis with all that that means and that continues to ripple out in a whole lot of ways. Lack of inclusiveness, resistance to change. Think of the, the hostility, and hostility is not an overstated word, the hostility that's directed at Pope Francis, as if he is somehow single-handedly seeking to destroy the church rather than, as most of us, I think, would say, seeking to free the church from lots of things that have limited us. And then the impact of so much of this, what people refer to as the nuns and the duns. Uh, people with no religion, people who are done with religion. So, you know, there's enough there for sort of the rest of your life to keep unpacking. One way to think about this in terms of a faith response is to see that, that God embraces dislocation. You know, creation, if you like, is the primary act of God's dislocation. In other words, God could quite comfortably have sat around being God. I'm not sure what it's like to sit around being God, but there must be something really nice about it, at least. Uh, but what does God do? God creates. God utters God's self beyond God to bring about life. And from, as it were, day one, that must give God lots of headaches. Uh, and then, just to make it even worse, God creates us. And that's even more dislocating. But it's not only what God does, it's our experience of God is no longer surrounded with the same certainty and even the same language as it once was. In so many ways, God, the word for people, has become an alien word or even a word to react against. I don't want to hear that God stuff. I don't want to hear about Jesus. So, when we talk about God, and particularly when we do it in context where there's a shared sense of it, we also know that that's not shared by everybody. And so, how to find a language to talk about God that connects beyond our narrow circles so that you know, one of the temptations is to circle the wagons and to say, well, we will only talk to people who are like us. And that's a fundamental contradiction of the spirit of the gospel and of the spirit of creation that moves outward and not in that enclosed way. There's lots of literature now about the, 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 the disaffiliation, the distancing of people from the church in an explicit sense. So not a sense, well, people have just drifted away from religion. That, that's not the, what people name as the experience of this moment. It's the experience of explicitly rejecting religion, or either because the, the, the history of it has been oppressive, so the whole decolonial association between European expansions and colonisation and its connection to religion, or particularly for Catholics, in light of the abuse crisis, that this is not a body to which we want to belong. And often, it's the sense that what the church represents doesn't have a place for me. So, 
this is not a new perception, but nonetheless it's a strengthened perception, that the church so often seems to present itself as the community of the perfect. The reality, of course, it's the community of the imperfect. But if we act and talk as if there is no place except for people who fit my narrow definition of goodness, then it can't be a surprise that people don't feel at home in the church. So there's lots of ways to respond to all of this. As, as I said, the, the, I, I'm not so much dealing with all the good things that can happen, but, but I'm, I want to take this experience of dislocation and really encourage us to think together about how we think about it. So it's not, I'm here to give you a whole series of answers. I, I increasingly think of the role of theology as about resourcing. It, it's about enabling people to understand what resources we have in our tradition to be creative. The, the, the connection between the tradition and creativity is a profoundly undervalued one. We, we often use uh, tradition as what stops creativity. I, I'd want to argue properly understood, it's what empowers creativity. And at the heart of the tradition, and this is Eve Congar and all through the middle half of the 20th century, it, it's the living spirit in the church that has been lived over time. And it's up to us now to appropriate that in our time. So Congar's work was very influenced by Maurice Blondel, a, a French philosopher who uh, narrowly avoided condemnation in the modernist crisis at the turn of the 20th century. And one of Blondel's aphorisms was that tradition's power of conservation is equaled by its power of conquest. In other words, tradition drives movement rather than simply being what you have to keep carrying around with you. So the challenge for Catholics is to move beyond thinking about tradition as what the American theologian Terence Tilley refers to as a heavy golden rock. And each of those words is important. Uh, it's heavy because you feel the weight of 2,000 years of history. It's golden because we know lots of good things have animated the life of faith over time. But it's often perceived, third, as a rock, which means you can't change it. It just is. A and I think the best thinking about tradition challenges each of those terms as negative terms and allows us to think about the heavy and the golden and even the rock part as positive. So let's look at what, what's the opposite to all of that. So that's the positive side. What's the opposite to all of that? The first one is, can't we get back to a simpler time? Well, breaking news here, it was never a simpler time. <laughs> it just looked different. And people experienced it as simpler, either in often ways, because it, it could mean eliminating the questions. Life is much simpler if there are no questions. Uh, it's when you let in the complexity that, in fact, we're all challenged to something bigger than what we have. And it seems to me that's precisely what Francis is doing. Francis talks about the church being messy. And, and by that, he, he's not trying to make it messy. He's trying to say, look, it is messy and neatness is an illusion. It's worth noting, neatness is not a gospel value. Jesus never talks about how important it was to be neat. <laughs> he talks about how important it is to be authentic, to be faithful. And you can't be faithful by distilling out the things that, that bring about the complexity of the spirit. One of my favourite definitions of the spirit that comes from Rana, where he says, the spirit is the spirit of dynamic unrest. Dynamic unrest. Uh, th that can make the spirit difficult to live with, but it also keeps us moving. So, again, there can be, particularly for church people, a sense that there was once a golden age. It, it was once better. And often when people are using that sort of language, they're, they're quoting numbers. You know, 
there used to be more of this and more of that and so on. But whether that was actually better it would be something you'd have to explore and debate. Uh, but the thing about the past is you can't go back to it. It simply doesn't exist anymore. There is no past except in memory. All we have is the present and the movement into a future. And the future doesn't exist yet either. So it's how do we live in our present that receives the past positively, that looks towards the future that we want to bring about, but that we can only bring about by living creatively in the present. You know, I, I often say that you and I are the first people, the only people, ever to have been the church in June of 2023. It's worth just letting that in for a sec. Nobody else has ever been the church in June of 2023. doesn't make us special, but it means that we have a task that nobody else has ever had. So we can't check the back of the book for the answer to how to do this. We actually have to do this ourselves. And we do it by receiving what has come from the past and making it our own with a, a recognition that we have to pass this on to the people who come after us. But it's what that we do in the here and now is going to be what we pass on, rather than we've got to get back to somewhere. And the third way, and I think this is the category in which people often put Pope Francis, is bl who's to blame for this? Someone must be blamed for this. Uh, one of the things about living in the, in the States is you, litigation for personal injuries. You can't drive on an interstate freeway without these massive signs, which are almost as width of this room, the height of this room, about personal injury lawyers. Because if anyone has an injury, somebody must be to blame for it. Uh, I actually fell over the footpath in Strathfield last Sunday walking, walking home from Mass and I was as sober as a judge. Uh, I think I'll be suing Strathfield Council <laughs> for the raised footpath that tripped me. So that's often, it's much easier to have someone to blame I have a Gary Larson cartoon which is too small to put up and I don't want to break his copyright. That that's this man unshaven in a singlet and this crowd of protesters outside his window. And the caption reads, The world was going down the tubes. They needed someone to blame. They found Wayne. <laughs> so we all have Waynes in our life. Apologies to everyone in the room called Wayne by the way. So Wayne is the person who's to blame. And in this instance, Vatican II is to blame, or Pope Francis is to blame. If Pope Francis hadn't confused people, then the churches would be full. Well, slight <laughs> reality check on that one. But, so in other words, it, there's something emotionally comforting about, oh, well, if I can blame someone, I'm not responsible. Uh, whereas in reality, we're all responsible. And I don't mean in terms of blame or fault, but we're all responsible for the church that we have or that we want. So I, I said a moment ago that, that, that God is God's self dislocating. God dislocates God's self rather than that we impose dislocation on God. So this is, this is Rana. The, the point of this quote is that God, and you can see they're simply talking about the word, let alone the reality, God challenges all our understandings of God. No understanding of God is ever going to be sufficient to the reality of God. Okay? Doesn't mean that our understandings of God are simply wrong. Doesn't mean that at all. But our understanding of God is never going to be the same size as God. Put it that way. The danger is that we are forever trying to get God to fit inside our existing understandings of God. What, what's the, the one single word for doing that? Making God less than God is. Idolatry. Idolatry. When human beings appear in the book of Genesis, the first thing they do is to try to make themselves in charge. 
We don't want God to be in charge, we want to be in charge. And you can make the case that from Genesis 3 onwards, the story of humanity is the story of the temptation to idolatry. Making God less than God is, so that God no longer is demanding on us. I always feel sorry for poor old God there, because we tend to think all God wants is to make life difficult. From God's point of view, all God wants is to let us know that we're loved unconditionally. Uh, But to let that in, we have to be expanded rather than God being shrunk. So it's really important to keep checking our understandings of God and our sense of speaking for God often, well, we don't think God would like this. Now, we mightn't be as explicit as that, but that's often the subtext of how we are responding to things. So this is is Elizabeth Johnson, which it's Elizabeth Johnson channeling her inner Rana, I think. And of course, the key word there is mystery. Mystery doesn't mean something that we just can't know about. It means something that is always bigger than our grasp of it. And so to deal with a God who is, as she ends there, literally incomprehensible is not a great selling point. <laughs> McDonald's would never use that language. <laughs> Be- because it, it, it tells us that a relationship with God is always going to ask our movement. And, and that gets back to the pilgrim idea. You know, when God begins to deal with humanity in the scriptures... Movement is what God asks. And it's sometimes it's literal movement, you know, the call to Abraham and so on. And other times, most often, and certainly in the New Testament, it's movement in terms of attitudes and values and how you think about yourself, how you think about other people and how you think about engaging with the world. And when we say no to it, not only are we making God smaller, then we're also at risk of inflicting damage on one another, trying to force other people to fit in our world, in our sort of sized world, or rejecting them because we don't. And similarly, I think you can make the the case that faith of its nature is dislocating. So Beth Johnson again. Here's a really powerful description. That, that if we make God too small, then eventually there's no room for God. If we think about it the other way, that, that God is forever calling us to grow, God is never smaller than us. God is always larger than us. And I think as a church, we've often seen this, that the point she's making in the second part, If the God they lead on is is inadequate, they will live a cramped religious life. That's such a contradiction. Religious life, I don't mean bad religious, but the life of faith, is not meant to cramp us. It's meant to expand us. But in order to embrace the expansion, we've got to be willing to grapple with this, this unbounded nature of God. And you can make a case of uh, that similarly has to apply the church. This is Sean Copeland, who's an African-American theologian, retired just a few years ago, worked uh, on uh, at Boston College, where I am. So, as you can see, there are two movements there. One movement, and what sort of a a pre-movement, if you like, which is to recognise those things that are exclusionary. And sometimes we're going to be called to account for that. Other people are going to point it out to us. But we can also discover it ourselves. We can come to a sense that how we are or what we value or how we treat people is not in line with what the Gospel is asking of us. And so to let go of those things is not simply to be in a big space, 
It's to recognise we need to replace them with what does reflect God and what God asks of us in a better way, in a more authentic, richer, faithful way. And this is a process sometimes that needs to be done with great sort of focus and energy because it's urgent. And I, I would suggest that, that that is part of what modern Australia is going through with the whole discussion about the voice. It's what we as a church are going through about synodality. Because if you look at, if you look at you know, the 220,000 responses that there were in Australia to the, uh, the invitation to participate in the preparation for the Plenary Council, if you look at all the national synod documents that have come out since and the, the working document that came out last week, people are naming what is exclusionary. They're naming the groups who are excluded. But they're also saying that this is not compatible with who we are to be as a church. So this is not something that we could say, well, this ought to happen. We should be doing these things. We are doing this. And synodality is, is a moment, is a vehicle for allowing us to move even more deeply into it without knowing what the outcome is. You know, it seems to me one of the, the one aspect of the great wisdom of Pope Francis on this is to say is to keep extending the time of the synod. So it should have been before and now it's 23 but it's also going to be 24 and I wouldn't be surprised if it goes into 25 and so on. And why? Well because questions take time to emerge and it takes time then to come up with answers. I mean, there's always people who have the answers to every question, uh, but they're not necessarily the answers you need that are going to be very helpful. So Michael, in reading out his definition of conversation from the early days of Catalyst, you know, the, the, the need to listen, with not with a sense of, I'm waiting for you to finish so I can talk, but... What is it that there's here that might expand me, that might challenge me, that might offer me things I haven't received before? And if we are doing that on a large level, and it needs to take place at every level of the church of life, then it's complex, it's time-consuming, it demands patience, demands generosity, demands humility. And none of that happens without being grounded in the Holy Spirit, which is where discernment becomes so important. So how might we live in this in-betweenness then? So the first thing, the, the, the fundamental reality, as people who come into being through God, we are, we are called on this journey of faith that ultimately bring, comes to fullness in in the Trinitarian life of God. And we're not yet at the end of it. So that, that's sort of the sine qua non of, of the whole thing. The other thing that's important here, and the dislocation of discipleship is a phrase, again, I'm taking from Paul Crowley's book, is we don't need to wait to practice w what this means. So you and I have an opportunity every day of our lives, every moment of our lives, to embody the discipleship that calls us beyond ourselves. How we treat one another. How we respond to what's going on in our world. How we are willing to question our own values and emphases. And all of that is going to keep drawing us back to our grounding and our relationship with God in Christ that is both personal and communal. It's a personal relationship we have with God, not a private relationship. A private relationship with God would mean there's only God and me. A personal relationship means it is about me, but the only me there is is a me who's in relationship to everybody else. So our relationship with God is simultaneously and irreducibly personal and communal. And if you think about it, that's what our liturgy seeks to express. 
we, we come together from our individual lives and are sent out back into those lives, but we're also sent out together. I, I love this little quote from Francis from uh, Gaudete et Exaltate. Holiness is the most attractive face of the church. In some ways, you think, yeah, sure, of course that's true. But, but if you let it in, you know, the question becomes, what, what face am I reflecting? And holiness doesn't mean being pious, doesn't mean being abstracted from life. It means how you live your life as a disciple, as somebody who recognises that we are called to relationship with God and relationship with one another. So, uh, just a, a couple of then specific quotes on what this in-between church would look like in a more faithful way. So, there, there are two quotes that will come up here. One from uh, the English theologian, whose name I've just forgotten, but you'll see her name at the bottom of this quote, and, and, and the other one but from Walter Casper. Claire Watt, there you go. Oh, sure, okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah. So the quote is, authentic ecclesiology, so an authentic theology of church, is able to speak truthfully about concrete realities and faithfully about the historical and present promise of the Spirit enlivening the church. Again, two dimensions. That faithfulness enables us to name our present reality. Okay? We, we don't live in, an, an ab, in a fantasy world about the church. We, we can look at the church and recognise its brokenness. But in doing so, we, we don't give way to despair simply because of our faith and our hope in the presence of God at work in this people. The God who's drawing us into a future. So, hope then is not that everything is wonderful and therefore it's all going to be fine. Hope enables us to name reality. Paul Crowley, who I've been quoting there, has another little book on hope, which is called Unwanted Wisdom. It's a, it's a most wonderful reflection on hope that I know. It, he wrote it after the death of two of his siblings, one of his sisters from cancer and his brother from AIDS. And he's reflecting on what does hope mean in the context of loss. And one of the points he makes is to say, hope enables obedience to what horrifies. Obedience to what horrifies. It's a really stirring phrase. And what I think he means is, because we are held by something bigger than ourselves, we can name reality as it is. We don't have to pretend that it's otherwise. And this is Casper. Walter Casper, of course, just turned 90, uh, a really significant post-Vatican II theologian, German bishop, uh, someone who's been important for Pope Francis. Oh, sure, sorry, sorry. Um, I, I, I'm standing here thinking, oh, I like that. Um, <laughs> true love for the church is no dreaming enthusiasm. In other words, when we don't have to say everything about the church is wonderful, I like all the people in it. Sometimes I actually wonder, why did God let these people in? You know? uh, Yet it is also not self-righteous or hard-hearted. I, I think the balance between those two things is really important. It, it's not the illusion that everyone and everything is wonderful, but it's equally not, well, these people are really bad and I, I don't, just don't like them and they're making a mess of it and so on. Uh, it's recognising that I make a mess of it too. It is realistic through and through and must stand the test in realism, faithful perseverance and constantly new forgiving. Realism, faithful perseverance, and constantly new forgiving. And of course, often the one we have to forgive is ourselves, when we obscure the church. I mean, it's one of the really important things to keep in mind, that for some people, you're the only church they experience. And so how you are with them is how the church is. Most of us are not going to run into Pope Francis out on George Street. Uh, but people are going to run into us. And particularly if we're known as church people, then 
how we are is how the church is. It's not the bishops who should be doing this. Well, maybe the bishops should be doing it too, but that doesn't absolve us from doing it. And I think that was the last one. Yes. So, be, before I hand this back over to you, Denise is going to give out the, some handout. And so this is... The handout you'll get is entitled The Church and Contemporary Challenges. And it simply says, in the context of, and it names seven points, that, some of which I've alluded to already, that affect how we are as church in this time. And for each of those seven points, it asks a question, or a series of questions, about how we respond as church. I should say, this list is not definitive. These are not the only seven things that are significant in the present life of the church. So you might have a whole lot of other things that you would want to add to this list. Uh, but for all of them, the, the question becomes, how do you live, how do we live the experience of being church? So when you get those, please just feel free to, to read through those for a few minutes. So when you're ready, you might just like to talk to the people around you, either things on that sheet, things you heard, um, the people at the back who haven't got the sheet yet, just talk about whatever. Just, yeah. uh, okay, thank you, everyone. Can we come back this way, please? So I'm, I'm very happy to enter into conversation with you about all of this. Okay, thank you very much. I know. So we have, we have exactly half an hour, so I'm happy... That, Please don't think it has to be question and answer, so I'm happy to, you know, for, to hear your response and we'll go from there. So I think we have, a, we have a microphone somewhere. Yeah, so if you wouldn't mind waiting till the mic, if you want to make a comment, if you wouldn't mind waiting till the mic comes to you so everyone can hear it. So, floor is yours. Thanks, Richard. Fantastic talk. Um, I was just wondering what your thoughts are, particularly in relation to number seven, about people are recalibrating their relationship with church. And I'm thinking of people like myself who go to Mass occasionally, but I'm a member of an ecumenical Christian meditation group involved with groups like Future Church in Ohio. I don't know if you're familiar with them. Yeah, who are really open about the inclusivity they're wanting from church, uh, particularly in relation to women. Um, just wondered what your thoughts are about that movement that I see happening with a lot of people in the church uh, who haven't thrown the baby out of the bathwater, but they're also finding other forms of spiritual nourishment. Mm -hmm. No, thank you. Uh, I, I mean, look, I think it, what what helps people to engage is good, you know? I, so that's... I wouldn't equivocate about that. The, the only thing I would say is, is that it seems to me that the Catholic genius, and it's Catholic with a, 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 both a large and a small c is to the challenge to hold everything together. Uh, because I can say, well, I have this group and I'm really happy with this group and that's where God wants me to be. There's a little bit of a danger then that I, I'm actually making God that, that smaller God. Uh, it, it seems to me the Catholic genius is a bit like juggling. You know, it, it, the, the trick about juggling is not having one tennis ball and being able to do this. Sometimes that's hard, but still. <laughs> the trick is when you get five tennis balls uh, and you're trying to keep all of them in play at the same time. So it seems to me that the Catholic vision is about breadth and depth uh, and the challenge to, to not give up hope on the whole thing rather than I have my group and that's sufficient for me. So yes, it's positive, but be just that slight you know, warning light about making sure we're not, we're not in whatever we're valuing as the issue, we're not then losing other things. And that would apply across the board, you know. People who think liturgy is the only thing we should be worrying about. Social justice is the only thing we should be worrying about, and so on and so on. Uh, it, it's, it's about breadth and not merely depth. Thanks, Richard. Um, I just wonder what you think um, you know, about God and the church, given uh, the ever-growing interest in cosmology, you know, sort of the, the new story. I was listening to a, a talk by John Hort, 
mm-hmm. recently, and he I don't I don't understand it, but he talks a lot about God of the future, and God coming to us from the future. So what might um, I think you know. Um, the cosmology just blows your mind about our understanding of God. You know, um, I forget who it was. It says, we've always got to empty out our teacup, God. Mm-hmm. You know, God is, as you were saying, God too small. If you, I know you, you're not, you don't specialise in cosmology, but you must ask yourself questions or how you've been impacted by that thought. Yeah, I think without claiming in any way to understand the physics of it myself... Uh, I think it's you know, part of the dislocation that I was talking about is to recognise that this is going to call us to a, a broader understanding of God. So rather than, to take the extreme example, becoming flat earthers and you know, taking that, that the days of the creation story are literally 24-hour days and then God had a day off. So that's one end of the spectrum. The other end of the spectrum would be that, that this just simply abolishes God. Uh, there's no room for God anymore. The, the Big Bang explains everything. I, I, my, this is why I like the in-betweenness. Between those two extremes, there's a lot of space. Uh, to use a, a deliberate... It's <laughs> my Stephen Hawking moment there. Uh, it's what you do inside that space. You know, are you open to the fact that, that our orientation to God not only allows us to look beyond our inherited understanding, but actually requires us to. Not in a way that makes us smarter than our ancestors, but but at least acknowledges that we are here and we can't, to use a double negative, we can't not engage with the here and nowness of those things. What what all that means specifically, I do not know. Uh, But I don't think we have to fear the possibility as this means we're going to lose everything. That... You know, that, that would be a lack of faith in God, really. So I think just keep engaging with what we need to engage with and see where it takes us. I didn't do any science at school because it wasn't on offer. So most of my science education has come via Brian Cox with those programs on TV. And he has just blown my mind apart with the immensity of the universe, etc., and the dignity that's behind it all, and that has really let God out of the box. I think it's deepened my theology. Um, I've got much deeper appreciation of God, whatever God is, Mm -hmm. and um, it's really enriched me, and I'm sure that's not in Brian's mind when he's putting his programs together, but I've valued and, and grown in theologically by watching those programs. It's been exciting. Yeah. yeah. That's great. Thank you. That's great. This is just a comment, probably not a question. Uh, a couple of months ago, Christopher Lamb wrote an article in the tablet, um, critical of an article that was in the Catholic Weekly, of all things. And um, the last line of his article was, what's going on in Sydney? Um, which is interesting. And... It was just listening to you this afternoon, a number of the issues that appear on this um, sort of make sense to answer Christopher Lamb's comment, what's going on in Sydney. So thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. And again, I'd say about all the issues, I, I didn't list these here because I have the answers to all of these. Uh, I, I put them here because I think they're real questions. Uh, and what, what I'm seeking to do is to name some of the implications that these might have for us as church. But we have to live into this. We have to live into the answers. And also keep in mind that if it were possible to get answers, in quotes, to all of these seven questions where we could go, oh, thanks be to God, that's done, um, (laughs) then the one thing you can guarantee with utter certainty is that there's another question coming along in about two minutes' time. And, and so on and so on. So it, we, it's not that we get to the end of this. And I think that's often how it, people can want to frame it, that we'll get, we'll get over this. Uh, we'll get beyond this COVID stuff and, and it'll all be fine. And we'll get back to business as normal. Well, w- we won't because we've been changed by COVID. Uh, and COVID's given rise to lots of other things that we have to keep thinking about, including all the, the ways it showed up in equality in the health system, in who had access to vaccines, and the, the wider question. So uh, 
the whole debate that's going on in, in this country and certainly in the States as well about housing and how do we house a growing population in ways that don't allow the super wealthy people that just cut themselves off from responsibility for being part of the common good. Now, as a church, we have, we have tools for this that the principles of Catholic social teaching about common good and solidarity and equality and so on, they don't give us answers, but they give us a framework for trying to, to grapple and, and to have something to say in these questions. And, and it doesn't mean that people are going to then say, oh, thank you very much, church, that's really good. We, you've given us the answers we all want. But, but our responsibility, it seems to me, is faithfulness, not success. I think it's really important that we sort of let go of that what God is going to ask us at the end is, well, did you succeed? Did you change the world? No, that, that's up to God to do that. But what God can ask us individually and collectively is, were you faithful? And that's what we have to take responsibility for. Thank you, Richard. Richard, this paper seems to talk about the, uh, the human condition. Mm-hmm. And it's uh, subject to change and subject to flux and anxiety, post-colonialism, all these things impinging upon us uh, as though they've never impinged before. So it's this human condition that we all suffer from. Um, can we talk about God's condition? Well, is, God, is God possibly subject to change as well as God is all-powerful? And can God change without us knowing it? And if God does change, does it put more responsibility onto us? God must have initiative in all of this, surely. Well, the thing we can say about God is that God chooses to be found where we are. So one of my favourite little aphorisms from Rana is that, that grace has an incarnational tendency. Grace has an incarnational tendency. In other words, that that God communicates to us as we are. God doesn't try and drag us to be God because we can't be God. But God comes to meet us where we are and as we are. So in terms of God changing, we have to sort of just think a little bit about our terminology as if somehow God is is an object in time. But God is not an object in time. God always exceeds everything we can know or say about God. What we can reflect on is our experience of God and how we locate God within our experience and how that is what changes our understanding of God rather than that this is about God changing. You know, it, that, that, that whole discussion about whether God can change can become a distraction from thinking about our responsibility for the world in which we live, which is God's world. You know, it's never a world without grace. It is a graced world. So our task is how do we respond to that grace? Richard, um, you never mention joy in here anywhere, I don't think. Um, so you, you name so much that is beautifully named, but you don't, from what I can quickly see, sort of hold out the hope of the joy of clarity. Okay, thank you. Uh, I, 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 I just don't know that you can aim at joy as the desired outcome. It seems to me joy is the... Is the is the byproduct, is the fruit of living authentically. So what I'm trying to name are the things that challenge us to live authentically rather than being able to say, look, if you do this, then joy will come. But, but I, think, I think joy does come, but not, not in the sense of, oh, thanks be to God, now I've got joy and I'll put it in my pocket and you know, carry it around with me. Uh, I, I think that's, the na- that's our pilgrim reality, that, that we don't get to hold these things in a way that says we will never again have to move. And, and I did talk about hope, though. I'll put my hand up on that one. Uh, but, but again, hope 
it seems to me hope is both a, a, a source of freedom from something, from being crushed by all of this and saying, oh dear God in heaven, I can't do any of those things. But, but hope is also the freedom to keep engaging with that because I know that it all doesn't depend on me and that I'm held. And Pope Benedict has this wonderful line in Space Selvi, his document on hope, where he says, it's the knowledge that I'm held by something greater than myself that allows me to face all that I need to face and to do so with confidence. And joy, is a, joy and hope are byproducts of this sense of being held. That's why faith, hope and love go together. I know the God in whom I believe and that God then frees me, which is hope, and frees me to love. So that you know, the faith, hope and love are inextricably linked. Uh, but, but none of them are things that we ultimately get to control. Uh, Nicholas Lash, the English theologian who died just not too long ago, says that, that what distinguishes hope from both pessimism and optimism is that pessimism and optimism both know the answer. Pessimism knows the answer is it's all bad. Optimism knows the answer is it's all good. And hope, he says, is the in-between space. And he says that the language of hope is prayer because it's prayer out of that knowledge that it, it doesn't all depend on me. It can't all come from me. Uh, but that I can be confident that the God in whom I believe is the God who cannot be overcome by anything, including the things that make us most afraid and paradigmatically death. So I think it's rather than saying, well, look, here's the solution, here's the formula for, for joy, I think it's understanding joy as the byproduct of authenticity and as part of the journey. Thanks, Geraldine. I was sitting here uh, thinking of uh, an interview I listened to this week, I think sent by Catalyst. It was Geraldine interviewing... Professor Rowlands, Anna Rowland, who used a wonderful expression, Richard, that you can use, theology at the service of reality. Mm -hmm. And just picking up this point, I sensed in Geraldine's voice, as I've sensed it before with others, that with our current way of thinking and our current culture, we're desperate for a bottom line. What does all this mean? Just, just give me the last chapter of the book, please. <laughs> oh, is that fair, Geraldine? It is. And the Jesuits had a meeting this week of their parishes in Adelaide I couldn't get to. But again, the feedback I had was so many parish priests are saying the same thing. How do I implement it in the parish? Where is the manual? Mm -hmm. Just give me the manual. And for me... Now, I find as much joy in uncertainty and mystery as I did in ever knowing an answer to anything. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a reality. It's a reality. And just final comment, I've just started reading the working document from last week. And, of course, it addresses the process to the process which is really what we're being invited to, somewhat scarily, because the Pope has described this as how we will be church in the third millennium. So personally, I'm not going to see a huge amount of it. But at the same time, they're focused on some very specific things as well. Not everybody's agenda, as you say, but some, because we've got to have both sides of this. We've got to see that movement towards certainty around, I think, LGBTIQA+, used as an acronym for the first time ever mm -hmm. in a Vatican document, ever. And at the same time, saying to us, as people of God, this is how I'm asking you to think about being. Mm -hmm. And we will get there very slowly. I don't know how long it takes to change a culture, in my secular life, trying to change the culture of the legal profession. Mm 
and I did have something to do with motor vehicle personal injury accidents. <laughs> but culture in the secular world, the experts there have said it takes as long to change a culture as the culture has been embedded. Think about that for the church. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I don't know if this is a question. Yeah, thank just you, a thank you. It, part of me wants to say certainty is overrated, you know. Um, I, I think the only... Uh, I like the language that Francis uses about he doesn't want the church to be a museum. Because um, museums are wonderful places, but it's full of dead stuff, by definition. Uh, it, and to not be dead is to deal with uncertainty. Now, it's really important that we nuance this a little, that uncertainty doesn't mean we've got no idea. That, that's not uncertainty. Uncertainty is where it's not all under control, where I'm aware of the questions. I'm aware of the need to keep moving. That, that's, I think, what we have to keep encouraging each other with is our certainty is the reality that there's a loving God and that that loving God has spoken in human history and Jesus and called us. Uh, what we have to then keep working out is what are the specifics of following that Jesus in the here and now. And... The encouragement we have, not just from the gospel, not just from the Eucharist, but the encouragement we have from, we can find people who are like-minded and not in a narrow way. You know, not, we're, we're not a gated community where we, we only want people like me to be here. Uh, we're not an enclave. People use all that sort of language. The church is not meant to be an enclave of the select few. Uh, it's the messy reality of humanity. You know, it, that the most famous... Summary, of course, is James Joyce's that Catholic Church is here comes everybody, um, with all of the complexity of that, and you know that that's where the good news is as well. It's paradoxical. It seems to me God's native language we hear as paradox. You know, how can God be about life and death in the one time? You know, there's life and there's death, and they're separate and they don't have anything to do with each other. But that's not true in Jesus. So I think when, when God hears, if God had the universal translator from Star Trek, we would hear God speaking paradox. Uh, and it's what enables us to live in paradox rather than to demand uh, th that it all be clear. And, and in terms of people, not, you know, what are you supposed to do? Well, you, you, you keep doing what you can. You know, that's why there is no blueprint. In theology of church, people write a lot in the last... 20 years or so, about what they call blueprint ecclesiology. That, that Jesus didn't give us, when something comes up, okay, turn to page 30 now and you get the answer to that question, and then page 74 has the answer to that question. No, we don't have that. What we have is the faith of, uh, in the, the presence of God's Holy Spirit embodied in us. You know, that's why it, it seems to me that, that we need to keep going back to Chapter 15 of the Acts of the Apostles, which is the decision about what do you do when Gentiles who are not Jews want to join the church. Now, it's important, that, you know, when you read Acts of the Apostles, this was the first existential crisis. What do you do here? And they can't say, quick, quick, find out where Jesus wrote down the answer to that one. Uh, but they have to work out the answer. So what do they do? Well, first, they come together. They pray. They have an exchange of views that was not always friendly. Uh, and eventually they make decisions. They have to make decisions. And what do they say in the letter they write back to the Gentile churches? It has seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. I think that is the most extraordinary phrase in the whole of the New Testament. It has seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. I, on one level it could seem arrogant, you know, they're saying, well, the Holy Spirit's agreeing with us. But that's not what they're saying. They're saying, having gone through this process, we believe that we have heard the voice of the Spirit and that we can teach this. And it seems to me, at its best, that's what church teaching has always seek to do, sought to do. And synodality now is giving us a framework to hear more than just the voices of the bishops. And in fact, it's giving the bishops the opportunity to hear the voice of the church.
of which they are part, of course, but, but they, you know, to, to speak is first to listen, and synodality, you know, the, the one word Francis uses over and over and over and over, synodality is about listening. Listening to the Holy Spirit, listening to the tradition, listening to each other. So, all, all of that, somewhere in there, is response to your question. Really, just a comment on that craving for certainty within, within our church. I'm constantly intrigued by the re-emergence of, the, I suppose, all kinds of things that belong to the pre-Vatican II church. And I'm old enough to remember it as a, as a teenager. And I wonder if that's part of the craving for certainty that we're seeing, to really go back to the past rather than trying to move forward with, with Francis and synodality. Well, it's also a way of freeing you from complexity, I think. Um, you know, it, it gives us a God who's often more manageable. And people can say, well, it's more about transcendence than, than the merely horizontal. And you know, there can be some truth in that, but, but again, the church is not either or. Uh, it, it's not a zero-sum game. It's not, we can only be one way. We are meant to be Catholic with a small c now. Uh, and you can't be Catholic if everybody is the same. That's not a Catholic church. But you can't be Catholic if people are different in ways that they can't actually be together. So that's why one holy Catholic and apostolic, the four go together. You can only be united if you find the motivation in holiness, if you're willing to be open to the past, and, and if you're willing to be open to the God who can be present everywhere rather than just somewhere. So it's understanding those four things are so interwoven and so much about the life of the Spirit that they can only be together. And so when I begin to say, well, the way it was was better, and the only, or even more, the way it was is the only way it can be, then something's missing. And that's when you know, I have to ask myself, am I in danger of making God too small? Yes, that's interesting when you uh, mention uh, we don't want God to be too small. Um, a lot of people um, say, who is this God? Or what is this God? And I've come to realise also we should be asking who are we? And Christians don't seem to listen enough, not just to the, the Gospels and to the readings in church, but um, to what people have written in order to try and help us understand these uh, readings and get something out of it. So I started to ask, who are we? And over time, I've heard uh, things that have helped me to try and understand this and there's a uh, phrase that says that we are made for God and um, God has chosen us for himself and we often think of God as being this huge uh, eternal incredibly uh, huge in eternal being so huge that we can't imagine it. Now if we try and think of who we are, I thought of um, the, the dark night of the soul where people are, some people are on their own and they feel very isolated but they feel hugely empty, infinitely empty and infinite was the word I was searching for just a few moments ago to try and describe God. So if God has made us for himself, it seems from these people who suffered this great darkness and this darkness of the soul that we are infinitely empty. We are in infinitely large and empty so that God, who is the wildest creature on earth on, in the universe can fit into. So it, it, now it makes sense to me who we are. We are 
made for God and God has chosen to uh, make us his place. So it seems that in the original original uh, sin where we seem to be split off from God um, people uh, I, I hear people saying that at one stage Adam and Eve and indeed the human race walked side by side with God and they were one so when God finds his place an infinite place to exist his home and that's something else someone said uh, God chooses to make his home in us Mm -hmm. so this is ultimately our destination when things are reconciled at the end of time we in God will be one. He will find our place in us. Okay, thank you. I, I think it's part of the same paradox, isn't it? That, that, that the infinite God should choose to make a home in us uh, and make us able to receive God. So it, 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 that, that's the inescapable paradox of our life, in fact, uh, that God never gets to be controllable by us, but that we have a potential for engagement with God that, that is God-given, that we have to make sure we don't make too small. So th- that's, I think it's part of the same paradox I've been talking about this afternoon. So, thank you. I think we probably have time for one more. Just going to your notes, we had a lively discussion group. We started off with the number seven, with the nuns and the disaffiliated people from the church. But we ended up mainly up in number two about artificial intelligence and the world of social media. And we looked at the people who discovered mass on demand during COVID-19, something we'd never thought about. Some people haven't gone back to their parishes. They've stayed with mass on demand. Mm -hmm. That's led us to ask the question, what is Eucharist? Have we expanded our concept of what is Eucharist? And could we have many forms of Eucharist that have always been taking place at ground, grassroots level, but we've never acknowledged them because they weren't the traditional form of the one and only Eucharist. Yeah. And I was looking back at number seven, um, possibilities for a creative and faithful change in structures mm-hmm. a- a- about Eucharist. Thank you. So just briefly on that, there are certainly multiple ways to experience God. You know, that if we believe we live in a grace world, then in fact you can't narrow the experience of God to certain aspects of it. Our response to God, if it's going to be fully human, is not just in our heads or even in our hearts. It's it's bodily, uh, which involves presence. So it's it's not in any way devaluing, as it were, virtual responses, but it's also knowing that that's not the whole of what we are capable of, so that we are able to be with each other physically. How people emerge from the experience of the last few years, what all that is going to mean for how we go about worship and so on, I, I don't know how all that's going to play out. But I think when we're not going to be able to settle for the virtual, as not because there's a law that you've got to go to mass or I don't mean that at all. I simply mean what, what's our potential as human beings that absolutely includes our embodiment and our capacity to be with one another in ways other than through the, the medium of a screen. But, but that experience, as you said, for lots of people has been enormously life-giving and has made it possible for people who otherwise wouldn't have access. So it, that's part of the same complexity, I think. So, and we'll, we'll just have to keep navigating our way through it. So. Thank you very much, Richard. Um, I can't help recalling... Uh, a public lecture which I attended at St Joseph's College in 1996, I believe, uh, Cardinal Martini was out here. And I remember his parting message. He says, the biggest challenge for the church is unity and diversity. And I've, that's exercised my mind, and I think it's, it's, it's wonderful. And I think you've reminded us of that. It's the very heart of Catholicity, I think... Uh, whether you use the word Catholic as a noun or an adjective, it will always be a disguised verb, I think. Uh, <laughs> the notion of noun is a bit static. Um, I was also thinking of a beautiful film I saw recently. Have you seen The Quiet Girl? Yes. 
uh, there's a, an exquisite moment in that where um, oh, it's an utterly ordinary, ordinary, ordinary thing, but beautiful, beautiful. And this little girl je- gradually, gently forms a relationship with a, an older man. And um, in a difficult moment, the old man turns to her and says, um, too many people miss the opportunity to be silent. And this little quiet girl is a sacrament of silence, as it were, that shouts a whole lot to us. It's a marvellous film. I highly recommend it. I was also thinking of a, a new word which I believe Anna Rowland used in the interview with Geraldine. The, I think she spoke about the decisionists. Did I get that right? Um, these people who, who want to close it down and say, OK, well, how's this going to work? And... Um, a text in John's Gospel keeps coming to me very, very powerfully. John chapter 14 when, you know, uh, yeah, and Thomas. Thomas wants the GPS, the coordinates, the manual, the, the answers. And Jesus says, Thomas, I am the way. And I think that's profound and worthy of a lot of uh, conversation. I'm going to finish with a, um, if I can find it, a quotation here which Sister Mari Biddle drew my attention to, a good Australian image which I think fits what we're all on about here. It's from a poem by Henry Lawson called Teams, The Teams, I think it is. This is just the first stanza. It's a long poem and not all of it applies, but this bit does. It's about a, a bullocky with his team of bullocks. A cloud of dust on the long white road and the teams go creeping on inch by inch with the weary load and by the power of the green hide goad the distant goal is won. Uh, Thank you Richard for a beautiful, uh, stimulating, wonderful afternoon and uh, for your announcing to us what I think most of us intuited. We wouldn't be here if we didn't. (laughs) Uh, and God bless you and your, the wonderful work that you do. Thank you. One last thing. You may, if you haven't already found it, there's an article down the back there. Um, every year uh, the Catalyst members get together and have a retreat day. Brother Ian Cribb, SJ... Uh, gave us our retreat there this year, and he recommended this article entitled Give the Spirit the Mic, A Strategy for Communal Discernment and Synodality by Brian Gogan. There's copies of it uh, down the back there on the table, so take one as you go.